All right, Part B, Lecture 9, Professor Barth, History of Money. So uh, if you saw Part A, and if you haven't seen Part A, you need to do so. I revised things a bit. We're not going to go into Ottoman Empire Renaissance, or Northern Renaissance, or the Portuguese today. Uh, yeah, the discussion, I think, is uh, goes a little deeper than I initially maybe anticipated. Part B, I'm going to take a little bit of a closer look at usury and Judaism in Renaissance Europe, especially Renaissance Italy, and more particularly than that, in Venice. Part A, again, if you haven't seen it yet, you're going to want to do that. I introduced the subject, subject of usury. Remember, usury prohibited very strictly by the Roman Catholic Church. There were some non-Jewish money lenders who, under the table, charged interest. That was actually quite common. So, you know, it happens, but officially, you're not allowed to do it. Not allowed to do it, even if you're a bank. And we looked at what alternatives to usury or charging interest on a loan. And then we looked at arguments in favor of interest, charging interest. Me personally, and I defend this in part A, uh, I'm in favor of, uh, of the right to charge interest on a loan. Nobody's forcing you to borrow money. And so if you object to paying interest on loan, well, don't borrow money. But, you know, otherwise people should have the right and freedom to, to do that or to loan that money and to charge interest if they if they so please. My personal view. All right. User in Judaism. Like I said, uh, in any history of money course, the the uh, this topic of finance and and Jews is something that is a recurring topic. We'll see it later with the rise of the Rothschild family. We'll look at the Rothschilds later. Uh, we see it in a rise of anti-Semitism, especially uh, in the 19th and the 20th centuries. Even in the current modern day, uh, you see this popping up a lot on both. Uh, and it's not in exclusively, it doesn't belong exclusively to the right. You also see it on the left as well. On uh, all sides of the political spectrum, uh, there is this uh, you know, suspicion about... Jewish finance. And so what's that all about? What does it have its roots in? And, and you know, where does that come from? It didn't just come out of thin air. It came from somewhere. And I think we can find the roots of, of some of this here in, in Renaissance Italy. So let's take some, a minute to look at that. Um, Mosaic law forbid Jews or the people of Israel to charge interest on loans to one another. Here's a verse from Deuteronomy chapter 23. Shall not charge interest on loans to your brother. You may charge a foreigner interest, but you may not charge your brother interest. And there are some other verses on this. Um, so it, the people of Israel were not permitted to charge interest to each other, but they could with foreigners. Now, the Roman Catholic Church prohibited just blanket prohibition on interest whatsoever. And so the Jewish populations in Europe and especially in Italy, where the demand the demand for credit is growing. Talk about this. Demand for credit is growing. There's more commerce. There's more prosperity. And so this demand for credit. Jews being the only group that were allowed to openly charge interest on loans. Begin to uh, uh, enter into this. Not all Jews, but a certain uh, segment of the Jewish population begins to enter into into certain realms of finance. Now, in the um, 1970s, there was a sociologist published this paper, A Theory of Middleman Minorities. A Theory of Middleman Minorities. And it's real fascinating just to brush, um, to skim over the, the basic argument. But in his paper and in subsequent research, um, the, the theory has arisen about certain groups called middlemen minority, minorities. And Jews are not the only examples of this. Some other examples of middlemen minorities, the Chinese in Southeast Africa, Lebanese in parts of, or, uh, excuse me, the Chinese in Southeast Asia, the Lebanese in parts of Africa, Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, maybe a, 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 perhaps in that group you could also include um, maybe different ethnic retailers, uh, Korean shop owners in uh, some U.S. cities. Um, and, and the theory is that uh, 
in certain times in history, there are, mi there are minority groups, minority groups usually eth often ethnic, that are socially distinct from the rest of the community, but earn a reputation and, and, and in part participate economically as middlemen or as intermediaries between producers and consumers. Now, minorities are not always, minority groups are not always the ones who function as middlemen. We looked earlier in lecture eight at Italian merchants and Italian merchants were middlemen between the Near East and continental Europe. They bought goods produced in the Middle East or in China, and then they redistributed those goods, sold them at a profit to other groups in Asia. And those were not minority groups. They were just Italian Gentile merchants. But when a minority group gets involved in intermediary activity, it oftentimes can breed a certain uh, resentment or uh, hostility from the surrounding group. And oftentimes these middlemen minorities uh, funnel much of their activity into retailing on the one end and money lending on the other. Retailing and money lending can often be quite common for these groups. And again, not just Jews, but other middlemen minority groups. And, and retailing can range from any, everywhere between, you know, uh, 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 street peddling, you know, some little street peddler, all the way to you know a merchant that owns chains of stores. Uh, money lending can range from you know some small neighborhood pawnbroker to an international financier, right? The whole gamut, the whole um, spectrum. And uh, this intermediary position doesn't always have to be isn't always economic too. Sometimes it's it's a uh, it, they're middlemen in a social sense. For example. Um, oftentimes when there are two groups in a, in a particular country or land that don't get along or there's a lot of tension, um, a third group, this minority group can be used as sort of the intermediary, intermediary between those two groups. So in Europe, in medieval Europe, the nobility or the rulers often use Jews as intermediaries with the peasants to collect taxes or to collect rent from peasants, that's going to create some resentment from, from the peasants. Uh, but, you know, for the nobility, there's some use there in, in using them. And, and sure enough, actually, uh, uh, many European rulers um, often protected uh, uh, the Jewish minority in their land, or they could, from time to time, time to time, just arbitrarily remove that protection, in which case, uh, Jews would face persecution or were thrown out, thrown out of the kingdom or the city. Um, within middlemen minority groups, there's often, in in all of all of these cases, often a, a very strong ethic of of saving and of thriftiness. Now, sometimes this is interpreted as being stingy or uh, counting pennies, but the strong ethic of saving and thriftiness also allows for them to get involved in money lending. Right? Can't lend money unless you have saving. Many uh, middlemen minorities also have a reputation for a sort of uh, clannishness, uh, or, or maybe that, that might be too negative of a, of a term, strong family ties and uh, of cooperation, of cohesion, because sticking together, especially within the family, of working long hours. Uh, 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 Lebanese shopkeepers or Korean shopkeepers, for example, have a reputation for you know, keeping the business within the family and working, you know, 16, 18 hour days. But in almost all these cases, that group will become the target. I know I have a lot here in the slides, but you know, it's a, some of a complicated subject, complex subject, will often become the target of much suspicion and resentment. And, and much of that resentment comes from this idea, this notion that you're, th these people are not truly producing anything. They're not really producing anything. Most people in human history have you know, made their living either by toiling uh, on a farm or in a factory. And so when historically, when, when those people who are putting in that hard labor and that physical labor view somebody making money through retailing or through money lending, it, 
it, you know, in the case of retailing, buying goods at a lower price and then reselling them at a higher price, that suspicion arises. Why are you charging a higher price? You're charging more money for a good that you paid less for. There's something immoral about that. There's something suspicious about that. There's something parasitical about that. And so this feeling that these people are parasitically inserting themselves between the real producers and the real consumers. They're, 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 they've injected themselves in, in the middle of that. They're conjuring wealth, essentially, the accusation is, out of thin air. Sometimes you see this in critiques of capitalism. Uh, you'll hear people say, oh, the capitalists, the person who invested money in the capital goods, they're not really producing anything. The people who are really producing things are the workers in a factory. The workers, they're the ones who are truly producing things. But that's actually not the case if you look at it, because the workers are not, cannot uh, uh, produce, can, cannot work if they don't have the capital equipment uh, to work with. So, um, but any case, you, you see that even there a little bit, but this wealth seemingly comes out of nothing. And, and that is the cause of much of this, of, of this uh, suspicion. There's a sense that these middlemen minority groups are rearranging wealth that already exists, but are, have inserted themselves again, parasitically and distributing it in such a way that, that gives it to themselves that allots it to themselves. Demagogues, especially in times of economic crisis or of, of other crises, can, can pounce on this and exploit this sentiment um, very, very easily. And of course, as we know, demagogues throughout history have done that. Um, in the medieval days, even a plague broke out. Well, you, who do you, you turn on the Jews, right? Um, but again, it's not true just of the Jews. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, the Armenians were, played a similar role. They were entrepreneurs. They functioned as middlemen. And, uh, and the Ottomans, the Armenian genocide, killed a couple million Armenians um, at the beginning of the last century. But so in any case, returning to Judaism in Europe, of course, we have the, the stereotype of the, the Jewish uh, financier, the Jewish moneylender, the, the Shylock figure, who we see pictured here on, uh, in the back. Here's a Jewish ghetto so um, in Venice. So the Jews uh, were expelled from Spain in 1492 together with Muslims. So uh, not to get into too much detail, in 1492 there was a battle of Granada. Spain uh, kicked out the Muslims and the Jews who were in the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula or either forced them to convert to Christianity or, or kick them out. Many of the Jews found refuge in the Ottoman Empire and then through their... Uh, uh, their contacts in the Ottoman Empire, namely Constantinople, they came, they began to migrate to Venice because uh, the Venetians had a lot of, uh, dealt a lot commercially with the Ottoman Empire. Um, when the Jews came to Venice around 1509, I think was the first date, it's just a couple thousand of them. The Venetian government quick, at first was hesitant, but quickly found out, hey, actually they can be, this can be a source of money for our government. And so, but they were placed in a special portion of the city in a, uh, in a special area that obviously certain rights were, were, um, were uh, not permitted to this group. Um, for example, Jews were not allowed to, earn, to enter certain professions certain trade professions, certain, um, back then many of the trades were dominated by the guilds, the guilds, which was somewhat like a labor union, but uh, Jews were shut out of many of those trades. So in, in many respects, this was one of the few avenues that if you were an, uh, an enterprising Jew, this was one of the few trades that you could possibly or feasibly, feasibly enter. But even then, the, the Venetian government and other like governments um, uh, charge you a fee to get licensed and, and in, a, in an exchange for permitting you to function as a money lender, you as a Jew had to uh, loan money to the state or um, buy, essentially buy protection from the state. Jews were required to wear a red hat at all times in order to uh, make sure that they could be easily identified and of course um, relegated to, to this area. But uh, uh, it, but it wasn't just money lending. It was 
uh, again, retailing, pawn shops, pawn broking, um, and, and they would lend money, sometimes at pretty high rates, at what we would say user's rates. Sometimes rates could be as high as 15 to 25% if you were, if, uh, you were a borrower and you didn't have any credit. There was, uh, closing the Part B discussion here, very famous uh, Shakespearean play, The Merchant of Venice. The Merchant of Venice deals with this very question. Um, there was a merchant named Antonio, uh, a Gentile, and he antagonized one of the Jews in, in Venice, whose name was Shylock. So that's where that comes from, Shylock. And Antonio antagonized him two ways. One, he, he was quite overtly and openly anti-Semitic. A B, he antagonized him because Antonio lent out money without interest, and that forced Shylock to, to charge lower interest because Antonio, his competitor, is there lending money without interest. Well, anyway, uh, Antonio's friend needs to borrow money, and Antonio at the moment is currently low on cash. And so Antonio's friend goes to Shylock and asks to borrow money. Shylock says uh, that he will lend Antonio's friend money without interest, but on one condition. If Antonio's friend does not repay his loan on time, Shylock must have a pound of fl his flesh, a pound of flesh. Pretty dramatic story. Well, it's a drama. Um, anyway, uh, and the play goes on. I'm not going to summarize the whole thing. Well, it's... Uh, historically, many people have, have seen someone uh, have interpreted his play as um, anti-Semitic, but actually, um, uh, though maybe from a 21st century uh, perspective, um, someone who came out with this play would, would encounter a lot of criticism for that. Actually, um, Shakespeare pre presents Shylock as a very sympathetic character. Later in the book, when uh, in the play, when Shylock is uh, brought to trial. Shylock, a uh, very famous passage from uh, a few verses from that play. Shylock says the following, makes a case against uh, uh, the, the anti-Semitism of Antonio. He says, quote, Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer, as a Christian is? If he prick us, do we not bleed? So, yeah, man, Shakespeare was so genius. I mean, I, tell you, uh, I just, I'm a huge Shakespeare fan, you could say. Um, Shakespeare, wow, just absolutely incredible. I almost got like chills uh, uh, <laughs> reading that. Just, um, I mean, Shakespeare... Shakespeare is going to be studied for thousands of years into the future. Think about that. That's pretty hardcore. Um, but anyway, so that's that subject. This will come up, you know, again. But, you know, this is the most that we'll talk at length about this subject. Of course, when we get to a Rothschild family, Rothschild was a, the, the most famous of the Jewish uh, banking families. But that doesn't come about until the late 18th and especially 19th century. So and anyway, so that that covers that part B of our lecture, we're going to take a look at banking, but in the banking in Renaissance City, it wasn't Jewish. It was Gentile. It was just done a little bit differently, but it was dominated by a very, very powerful banking family, a Gentile family, uh, the Medici family. So tune in again for part B. See you there.